there was the sun going around the Earth. Well, in fact, the Earth goes around the sun, and you don't have to be a genius to get that. To which Wittgenstein is said to have replied, as philosophers will do, yeah, yeah. But I wonder what it would have looked like up there if the sun had been going around the Earth. Point being, of course, it would have looked exactly the same. What he was saying was that in any given circumstance, you see what your data at the time tell you you're seeing. You're in a box. So the difficulty we have with second-guessing innovation today would seem primarily to be that the present high rates of innovation are changing what you think you're seeing faster than most institutions and individuals can keep up. No wonder the reaction of the typical citizen to today's bewildering avalanche of innovation and technological novelty recalls the story of the depressive who gets a couple of days off from the clinic, goes to the beach and gives himself a tan. A couple of days later, his psychiatrist back in the hospital gets a postcard from this holiday depressive. The message on the card reads much the same way as the general public's reaction to today's accelerating rates of innovation, because the message on the card reads Having a wonderful time. Why? I think the reason this happens is that because suddenly these days, the future isn't what it used to be anymore. See, for the whole of history until now, we have lived with a dichotomy. A culture of scarcity, on the one hand, and the ability to innovate your way out of it, on the other. A hundred thousand years ago, the scarcity problem of the day was how to hunt and catch the dinner running away from you on the hoof so that you would survive to do it again tomorrow. Today's national deficit problem presents much the same challenge. But there's never been a time when there wasn't some kind of scarcity. We got so used to it that when the Industrial Revolution gave us mass production, we started inventing scarcity. The first consumer ads here in the United States in 1898 were for something called, you need a biscuit. Nobody needed a biscuit, but now they thought they did. Modern business would not last a minute without perceived scarcity. And scarcity is also, I think, why we have institutions established in the past, with the technology of the past, to handle some scarcity problem or other in the past. Food, raw materials, security, money, possessions, organizations. Single purpose institutions, which are still around today, and in many cases operating the same way they did when they started. The Stone Age Hunt Commander is today's CEO. Today we have oral legal proceedings because back then people couldn't read or write. Representative democracy, if you think about it, solved the 18th century problem of lousy, dangerous roads and no telecommunications by finding a couple of fools with a horse and time to spare to go to the capital and represent you. Roads are so bad and dangerous, they don't come back more than every few years to check on your opinion. After a while, these horse only fools become known as politicians. And their return journeys as elections. Today, we have perfect roads and telecom up the yin yang and the same single purpose 18th century political institution. Institutions are there to make sure that when we do innovate, so as to solve the problem of scarcity, we don't, at the same time, dangerously rock the boat. Your president, for example, takes an inaugural oath that says, preserve and protect, not change and replace. Even if sometimes that might be a good idea. The trouble is, the institution as a safety mechanism tends to keep us moving forwards, but looking backwards, which makes prediction even harder especially with prediction about the potential secondary ripple effects of any innovation, the unintended consequences, which almost always have very little direct connection with the original reason for the innovation. I mean, take this medieval example here on the screen. As I'm sure you know, this is the so-called Bayeux Tapestry, created in 1077 to commemorate the Battle of Hastings, 11 years earlier, when the invading French beat us Anglo-Saxons and took over England. Because they fought on horseback, and we fought on foot. They won, we lost. The French were on the horseback because they were using this 
the stirrup. The new gizmo recently arrived from uh, medieval Afghanistan, where it had originally been designed as a single step up to use when you were loading a camel. The French realized that if you put one of these steps on either side of a horse and stuck your feet in them, you'd stay anchored on the horse when you hit the enemy with your lance and the full weight of the horse. Shock troop, it's called. So the French cavalry creamed us Anglo-Saxon foot soldiers. All right, better military technology wins battles. But then came the ripple effect. Because when the French took over England, they also took over the language. And that's why hundreds of millions of us around the world now speak the way we do, and not the way we would be speaking if the French hadn't used the stirrup and won that battle, and if the English language hadn't become half French, which of course it is. We would still be talking unadulterated Anglo-Saxon. He Michel the help that a help that came a butcher by my very my and meekness. The unexpected worldwide ripple effect of one little camel loading gizmo. And that happened all the time, that unintended ripple effect. The typewriter took women out of the kitchen in Italy office and boosted the divorce rate. <laughs> Asbestos protected you from fire and was carcinogenic. The first refrigerators kept food fresh and punched a hole in the ozone layer. I'm sure you can pick up dozens of examples. The biggest unintended consequence of all time, to my way of thinking, was the one that shaped modern innovation itself, triggered when Christopher Columbus did his thing. Not discover America, but the fact that back in 1492, the definitive last word authority on all knowledge is Aristotle, whose definitive last word stuff includes a map of the world, on which America does not appear. So in 1492, what are you doing here? And worse is to come. Throughout the century after Columbus, flooding into Europe from this supposedly non-existent place, and then other newly discovered places around the globe, come new plants and animals and minerals and people nobody's ever seen before, and they are not on Aristotle's lists either. In the intellectual panic that follows, like, you know, geez, if Aristotle is wrong, there goes the epistemological neighborhood, a French military engineer the guy I would personally blame for everything, named René Descartes, comes up with a solution. A technique that ensures your data are trustworthy. So now you can innovate for scarcity with confidence. Descartes' technique locks down how we innovate, how we think about innovation, and how we adapt to it from then on. Because Descartes works out how to generate the kind of data that won't let you down, like Aristotle did with rules for thinking, that everybody conforms to. Modern innovation is based on Descartes' two rules. One, apply methodical doubt. If the guy tells you something is definite, think of it as probable. If he says it's probable, consider it possible. And if the word is it's possible, forget it. <laughs> two, be reductionist. Reduce your view of anything down to its simplest component elements. That way you'll see how it works, and if it breaks, how to fix it. Back then, we Europeans take to Descartes with all the abandon of an alcoholic in a brewery. Result, methodical doubt and reductionism kick off modern scientific method and turn the process of innovation into a noodler's paradise. Pretty soon, the reductionist mission statement becomes the one that has driven innovation and expertise of any kind ever since. Learn more and more about less and less. Like a pal of mine at Oxford who got his doctorate, in the 17th century English poet John Milton's use of the comma. He's now head of department at a major American university. Because he did what reductionism requires you to do to get ahead in any organization. Make your specialist niche so small, there's only room there for you. And then explain yourself only in your own gobbledygook. In this way, you are incomprehensible and therefore irreplaceable. This reductionist approach constrains a matter of knowledge and, more important, who gets it. And it has triggered accelerating innovation and the explosion of data faster than institutions and institutional thinking can handle. Because along the way, as reductionism has taken hold, the effect has been to fragment and multiply the disciplines into hundreds 
of scientific and technological niche studies, which then over time become disciplined in their own right, generating hundreds of their own niche studies. This scientific drilling down into the core of a discipline and the consequent emergence of stuff so specialized that nobody outside the field can understand it is also, of course, the reason why we in the industrial nations are in general the healthiest, wealthiest people in history. Because reductionist innovation has triggered spectacular advances. In each generation, a small number of noodlers has achieved what the previous generation would have described as miraculous. My laptop here could have landed Apollo 11 on the moon and run a movie at the same time. However, the other aspect of this highly focused, innovative, reductionist behavior is the way in which a lifetime of silo thinking, which modern research often requires of its acolytes, head down at their workbenches, makes it so difficult to predict what will happen if your noodling ever bumps into anybody else's noodling. Because when that happens, the rules of math change, and suddenly one and one makes three. The result of the process is more than the sum of the parts. Example, 19th century German engineer Wilhelm Maybach puts together the antiseptic spray, used back then in hospital operating theaters, so surgeons know about that, and kerosene, used in oil lamps, so lighting engineers know about that, and comes up with the carburetor for the new automobile manufacturers who know nothing about either antiseptics or illumination. But who then put the buggy whip people permanently out of business. Because the other thing about innovation is how often it's disruptive. At one stroke, the printing press took authority out of the hands of old people with memories and gave it to young people who could read. 19th century newspapers did the same to politicians when the, when the newspapers created public opinion. And thanks to scanning, who uses faxes anymore? Also, the more information is around, the more disruption happens. The inventor of information theory, the brilliant Claude Shannon, my personal hero, once said, information causes change. If it doesn't, it's not information. Example, no information, you are sitting in a seat. Information, the person next to you has a communicable disease. No more English jokes, okay. okay. <laughs> it's a truism though, isn't it, that over the last 50 years, the growth rate of information technology has brought radical innovation to every aspect of life. Together with advances in communications technology, IT has networked the world. But more important, it's changed the innovation process itself. First of all, in the science and technology silos that Descartes created, which became more and more specialized, so that in the 20th century, Innovation stopped being what gentlemen amateurs like Ben Franklin did and started instead coming out of R&D labs. I mean, as part of his work on thin film, for instance, physicist James Dewar kept a bubble they inflated for three years. End result, cling wrap and the packaging industry. Research into crystal structure led to genetic engineering. But here, in the early 21st century, the innovation process has changed again. Thanks to information technology, noodlers are coming out of their silos and talking to other noodlers with explosive effect. Because as the American mathematician and inventor of cybernetics, Norbert Wiener, once said, major innovations come, most of all, from the unexplored no man's land between the disciplines. So as IT makes it easier to cross the line between those disciplines, the rate of innovation surges. So if we want to compete in the new global marketplace, whether you either innovate or die, maybe we should be looking at ways for our educational systems to add to their specialist training programs, a few programs for training generalists, people who can think analytic, cross-discipline. Maybe Einstein was predictive when he said, we're all born with magnificent brains, which formal education then slowly destroys. I think he was referring to the linear Descartes reductionist mode of thinking we're all taught in school, where intelligence is still equated with focus and specialization. Old-fashioned values, perhaps, now that interdisciplinary is no longer a dirty word. Now, I've been working for a number of years on a small online tool designed to get students to think more interdisciplinary context about the stuff they're learning. The basic database for this thing 
is made up of about 2,800 people from history, split about equally between the humanities and the sciences, and interconnected among themselves about 35,000 ways. And the name of the game is to learn new things, find new connections, reveal new relationships, by taking journeys of discovery across the web to see how everything is ultimately connected to everything across all disciplines. What I'm hoping to do is to encourage users to think connectively and therefore innovatively in the 1 plus 1 equals 3 mode. Now, the project is still work in progress, so what I'll show you is just the plumbing. And because I'm running a bit short of time, I'll jump straight to the, the, the most basic bit of plumbing of all, this bit. This is the raw database. And let me start with Mozart. Now, in the Cartesian, in the standard straightforward way of learning stuff, you're doing Mozart, you're doing the history of music and everything associated with music. Here's a slightly different trip that you would take beginning with Mozart. Here's Mozart. The white lines lead to his primary contacts, the little yellow people are secondary contacts, and then all these funny ones here, these are all the potential links between the people on this page alone, and there are 2,800 pages, so it's quite large. So here's Mozart. Mozart steals the idea of the marriage of Figaro from a French playwright called Beaumarchais. Beaumarchais is known over here because he was a guy who set up a fake, fake company to launder the money to pay for the ships and guns and soldiers that the French sent over here to help you guys beat us guys in the War of Independence, without which, of course, you would have lost. <laughs> so Beaumarchais is a big favorite of a man called Thomas Jefferson. And as you know, Thomas Jefferson was lots of things, including he was against capital punishment. And he got that idea from an Italian thinker called Cesare Beccaria. Beccaria was the first guy to write about penology. Why do we send people to prison? What is punishment for? And so on. Now he, Beccaria, was a social reformer. And like many got his ideas from a couple of weirdos from uh, Austria called Gahl and Sportsheim. Gahl and Sportsheim invented this amazing stuff called phrenology. In the brain are organs of different parts of your character. You know, love, jealousy, uh, criminality, blah, blah, blah. If these organs are developed to more or less extent, they make a more or less large bump in your skull. So if you feel the skull of the person, you can tell what their character is like and see where they need to be improved. Radical reformers love it, especially one called Fallen, who is so radical, he stabs a lot of people and is hauled up in front of a judge called E.T.A. Hoffman, who's evening job is to write creepy stories, first ever, about when the, the dead come out of the grave at night and suck your blood and go back before dawn. These stories are picked up and improved on by your own Edgar Allan Poe. Poe is somebody who inspires some of the plots by a Russian musician called Rachmaninoff, and Rachmaninoff is at a party in Long Island one day, and he meets another Russian immigrant. So impresses him, this young guy, that Rachmaninoff gives him a colossal amount of money for the time, 5,000 bucks, which gives Sikorsky enough money to develop the first practical helicopter. So, Mozart to the helicopter in 10 easy jumps. <laughs> and 10 different disciplines, music, finance, politics, criminology, neurology, radicalism, law, literature, aeronautics. This is the way the brain works, interconnectedly. And all the brain needs to innovate and predict is the data and the analytics to contextualize the data. This kind of thinking is a key resource for what lies ahead in the next 20 years or so as the global marketplace becomes dominated by the knowledge economy. A market in which the rule will be the same as when humans first came out of the cave. Keep moving or die. Innovate or go out of business. I said the next 20 years or so because beyond that comes perhaps the greatest challenge, opportunity, innovation we've ever had to handle since the first flint tool. And this thing originated exactly 100 years ago with a couple of those one and one makes three events I love. 1911 was the year when a, a British meteorologist called C.T.R. Wilson built a little pressure drop gizmo to make clouds. It was called a cloud chamber. First time used, it revealed the tracks of what turned out to be subatomic particles. That same year, 1911, a company was founded using silk weaving control mechanisms involving holes punched in cards that would later take the name IBM. In 1981, those two separate strands came together in IBM's noble winning scanning tunneling microscope that used the quantum effect to let you move atoms around one at a time and make possible what is now called nanotechnology. 
I won't go on about nanotech, because you know it backwards, I'm sure. The field is, of course, intensely interdisciplinary. And it's advancing daily on so many fronts that keeping up with the work is like herding cats. And it's either already facilitating or promises to facilitate extrapolative rates of innovation, including at least the following general areas. Virtually free alternative energy systems, drug delivery to specific cells in the body, cheap, clean drinking water kits, a pollution-free planet, clean, efficient, non-wasteful manufacturing, food for everybody, silent, clean transportation systems, supercomputers on a chip, virtually free telecommunications, the end of the greenhouse effect and ozone layer problems, and intelligent infrastructures of all kinds. This is the kind of stuff politicians and institutional thinkers drool over. Quick solutions to immediate problems of scarcity that will get you re-elected or made chairman of the board. Nanotech, as they say, is the next big thing, kind of. And all the talk in all the government and industry and think tech reports on nanotech is about how long this will take, how we pay for it, how we train enough specialists to make it happen, how we get it out to the world and in particular the third world, how we deal with the problem of intellectual property rights on the tidal wave of innovation starting to build up already in nanotech, and above all, how we get the public on side and stop them worrying about the spectre of escaping nanorobots so tiny they look like grey goo and will eat the planet. In the midst of all this white hot technology blah blah, you read almost nothing about the elephant in the room. What is nanotech going to do socially and when? Now, you may feel that what I'm about to say is never going to happen. Well. Once that was said about going to the moon, x-rays, Viagra, airplanes, email, laptops, and writing the letters IBM with single xenon atoms. So hear me out, and forgive me if I put it a bit too simply. In 1981, IBM scanning tunneling microscope made it possible to move atoms around, so people started doing that. Now as you know, atoms like to get together to form molecules, and molecules like to get together with other molecules to form materials organic or inorganic. If you bring the right molecules together the right way, that's what they do. They self-assemble. Get enough of them to self-assemble, either using chemical soups or nanomacum manufacturing techniques, and you can make nano stuff. Put enough nano stuff together millions of times over, and you can make stuff big enough actually to see. Scale that up, and you can make anything. Fresh water, clothing, bricks and mortar, a car, gold, pasta, medications, a bottle of Chardonnay, solar cells, you name it. If it's anything to do with atoms and molecules, and what isn't, you can make it. And the feedstock for this gizmo, the molecular self-assembler or personal nanofactory, is in the main dirt, air, and water. Put one in your garage, and your autonomous catbird seat, who do you need? And then, the thing about the personal factory, that nanofactory, is it makes a copy of itself. So 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, the guess is one for everybody on the planet in a matter of months. Now I'm not making a case for how soon this will happen. That it will come is not in doubt among those who seem to know what they're talking about. No law of physics prevents it. When? Nobody knows for sure. Predictions from the labs are somewhere between 25 and 40 years. That's within many of your lifetimes. What I am arguing is that 40 years is no time at all for turning around an entire social and commercial infrastructure, remodeling society from the bottom up, working out in time for the event new rules for absolutely everything because absolutely everything will be affected. Let me end by leaving you with a few thoughts on why and what might be coming down the pike. Let's say that in 40 years or so, each of us can make every material thing we need, autonomously and at virtually no cost. Yes, the first manufacturing instruction programs going down the line to the assemblers will be proprietary and will cost money. But anyway, let's say that happens. What comes then is something for which our 100,000 years of talking, two million years of tool use, our millennial obsession with survival in the face of scarcity have not prepared us, and that is abundance. 
All our values and ethics and standards and beliefs and behavior patterns are based on scarcity. There's only one Michelangelo, diamonds are rare, few people get PhDs, crime against property happens. Every organization in the world is in some way solving the problem of scarcity, providing things that people don't have. So what happens to those organizations when people do have, and to all the jobs in those organizations, and to all the taxes they provide the economy with, so governments create and manage the national infrastructure. But if you no longer need power coming down the grid, or goods coming down the road, do you need an infrastructure? Or anything else government does? Police? Who's going to rob you if they have a new home? With your nano factory capable of making anything you might need, do you need any human doctors to cure you, or human teachers to qualify you for jobs which don't exist anyway? What do you need? Does abundance remove the stimulus of scarcity that used to power our creativity? How do we organize a global society composed not of 193 nations, but of 9 billion autonomous individuals? Is there any need to organize ourselves at all? What for? If people don't work anymore, what do they do with their time? If there is no scarcity, does anything have any value? Will nano weapons available to every individual trigger guerrilla warfare and the like of which we've never seen before, just for kicks? If so, how do we prevent that when in one sense there is no more we? Will any institution or organization survive in its present form? There are a million questions which abundance throws up to be answered, and we only have 40 years or so to predict an answer. Just as well we have the tools to do that, starting with the magic predictor I begin with. Today, there are, in the U.S. alone, 310,817,844 brains, most of them unused. <laughs> All of them capable of helping to solve this little problem if they're given the tools to handle the unbelievably complex matter of working out how to run a kind of balanced anarchy involving 9 billion people in a radically new kind of economy where what has value may be just ideas for what people can make with their manufacturers. 9 billion idiosyncratic consumers with nothing but their imagination to be satisfied. What an opportunity. As long as we can predict how to get there from here. Fortunately, as you saw at the start, that's what the brain is really good at. All it needs is to be able to access and run analytics on the gigantic amount of data that the challenge of preparing for abundance will involve. Gigantic because with each single issue you predict into the future, the potential variables multiply combinatorially. 1, 2, 3, 6, 24, 480, 3,600. That's seven jumps with one issue. One clue as to how we might begin to manage all this appeared last night on television. If you were watching, you might have seen the new system IBM has produced, codenamed Watson, competing with the Jeopardy chaps. But as you'll hear, Watson has a lot less to do with game shows and a lot more to do with a smarter way we're going to be able to manage the challenge of abundance. About this new dawn, I'm optimistic because pessimists jump out of the window and are no longer involved. <laughs> well, that's it. Thank you for listening to me and above all for saying all this ahead of me. You can stop now. Thanks.